So good evening. My name is Abby Edens, Director of Education at the National World War II Museum. And I wanna welcome you to our program this evening, Honor and Duty, a conversation on Chinese American World War II veterans. Our moderator for this program is my colleague at the World War II Museum, Dr. Tyler Bamford, the Sherry and Allen Leventhal Research Fellow in the Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. I will now turn this program over to Dr. Bamford so that he can introduce our panel. Thank you, Abby. As Abby said, it's my privilege to introduce our panelists this evening. The first panelist is Fang Wang. Fang was born in Canton, China and immigrated to the United States in November 1960 at the age of 12. He has been a naturalized citizen since January 1963. In addition to his Vietnam service, he also served tours of duty in Germany, Korea, and several stateside military bases. He retired from the Army in May 1989 and was elected the American Legion National Commander from 2011 to 2012. Frank Shearer completed 20 years of active, active enlisted and commissioned service in the U.S. Army, serving in field artillery and military intelligence assignments and retiring as a captain. He was employed as a historian for the U.S. Army Center of Military History for 22 years. As the center's chief archivist, he was branch chief of the Historical Resources Branch, which consisted of the Center of Military History Archive and Library for his last 14 years before retirement. Samantha Chang is an experienced journalist and documentarian. Chang is the co-founder of Heritage Series LLC a company that specializes in educational programs about U.S. ethnic minorities and their contribution to U.S. history. She is author and publisher of Honor and Duty, the Chinese American World War II Veterans, the subject of tonight's panel discussion. Finally, Elaine Feng Samrao is the daughter of a Chinese American World War II veteran. Her father, Jim Feng, proudly served in the U.S. Army during the years 1942 to 1946. Elaine has lived in Mississippi, where her dad operated a grocery store, and Illinois, where her father managed a relative's Chinese restaurant. A retired elementary school teacher, Elaine and her husband now split their time between Arizona and Canada. Welcome, everyone, and thank, thank you, you for joining us this evening. Thanks for having us. I want to begin uh, by talking uh, to Samantha. So, Samantha, how did your work on the stories of Chinese American veterans begin? This actually started, um, this stems from a documentary I did on the Mississippi Delta Chinese. And I needed to find the right hook to tell the story of the Chinese Americans in the Mississippi Delta. Chinese American history is not sexy. So it, was, it took me almost 20 years to find the right way to tell the story compelling enough to bring in a full audience. And I, was, I had the good fortune of meeting Dr. Gwendolyn Gong, who had done a tremendous amount of research on the veterans, uh, the service personnel from the Mississippi Delta. And from there, we discussed and talked about how to create a three-part series that aired on PBS on the Chinese and the Mississippi Delta. And that got me interested in the World War II veterans. So Honor and Duty is really a compendium uh, that lists all 22,000 plus Chinese Americans that served in World War II, is that correct? That is correct. This research was conducted over three years time, actually just a little bit more than three years. Um, we have been able to identify 22,827 World War II vets. We were able to verify their service through um, public domain sites, public information sites, through the National Archives, and through other primary source material. And so what is your eventual goal you know, with this project? What's your hope for it? Well, my hope is to have the service of Chinese Americans recorded in American history, that we are not passive Americans. We are patriotic as everyone else is, we are as American as everyone else. We just look a little different. You know, we can't change what our face looks like, but in our hearts, we are still all Americans. 
And this is such an important story to be told. I mean, I mean, the Chinese Americans were just one of many ethnic groups that contributed, but you know, every American that, that served in World War II, you know, deserves to be recognized for their service. And you know, this was a massive project, as you've said, and it was it eventually ended up at over 1,100 pages. Is that right? Yeah, it's at exactly uh, 10,000. No, it's excuse me, 1,098 pages. <laughs> So that, and it's a huge roll call. A thousand of those pages are a, a roll call based on state. So it's separated by state. There's an index that you can follow. There's an index for the um, what we call the main roll call. And then there's an index for the uh, disparate data set roll call. So you can find your family members that way. We also have aliases. Uh, that were known to us. So that's published in the parenthetical. And there is a lot of annotation and um, a lot of cross-referencing. And no doubt this will be a very invaluable resource to researchers well into the future. And now, of course, you didn't do this alone. So I want to turn to one of your, your partners on the project. Uh, yes. Frank, um, you, you provided research support on the project. And so I wanted to ask you um, how you became involved uh, with this massive undertaking. <laughs> Uh, Samantha was referred to me by a uh, ar retired army general uh, who I had worked with on a different project. So she said she needed help uh, identifying information about Chinese American soldiers. Uh, and I said, all right, I can do that offline. Um, and so I began doing that. She would send me snippets of information a lot of photographs, um, some documents saying, okay, what does this document mean? What do these initials mean? Um, he says he's in the Army Air, Air Corps or Air Force, but it looks like an Army uniform. And I had to explain, well, the Army Air Force and Army Air Corps were part of the Army and they wore the same uniform. It wasn't until 1947 and the Air Force becoming a separate organization that they designed their own uniforms. And it just sort of grew from there. Yeah, you raise a lot of important points that I think a lot of uh, our viewers who have tried, you know, have done World War II research on their own will have come across is that the Army during World War II really spoke a language of its own. They, they really invented the modern, uh, the acronyms that, that are so um, you know, abundant in our society today. Uh, so what, was there ever a question that Samantha sent you that really uh, proved challenging or difficult? You know, may, maybe um, talk about what resources you may have used to uh, you know, discover these things. Talk the about the Foot Locker. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, she said, okay, here's a picture of a Foot Locker. What can you tell me about it? And I said, uh, it's olive drab. <laughs> I said, okay, it's got the guy's number name, it's got his serial number, and I could trace back and say, okay, based upon his serial number, he went into the army at this lo this general location. Uh, I think there was a patch or two on it. I looked those up and I said, okay, here's what the patch was. It was one is of such and such a unit, and it was an Air Corps unit. Um, yeah, there was a lot, and there was other things of, Samantha, I've got no idea. It was quite an adventure, Tyler. It was, um, and it was truly a partnership because it wasn't just Frank. I mean, Fang could speak to the amount of time that we spent at the American Legions. Um, but we, let's not forget that this project also stems from the organization to, uh, advocate for servicemen and women to be honored and recognized with a Congressional Gold Medal. So it was very, very important for us to have a good or better understanding of the contribution of Chinese Americans in this war effort. And that helped us advocate with greater authority on the Hill. And I am proud to say without Fang's support of this bill in Congress and his diligence of him and his wife, Barbara, coming down to Washington on a regular basis, whenever I called and said, Fang, I need you, he's, he was always there. So this was a great community. Elaine Simra, 
her family served in World War, her father served in World War II. And it was her story and her father's story that compelled me to take this a whole nother level further than just having them um, featured in a documentary series. It was so important to realize that these Chinese men and women served, they had no path to citizenship, yet they served anyway. They truly believed that they could contribute something to the United States of America, and they did so willingly with great sacrifice to them and their families. And that gave all the greater impetus to your project, you know, and, and so the, Frank, you know, provided this valuable research support and you could, you really had this, this whole, this bigger overarching goal and driving force behind the project and the, the, the personal aspect, the door knocking uh, and, and the, the, the connections that you had to discover, um, you seem so important to this work. So I wanted to, to ask Fang about that. Um, so Fang, the American Legion was founded after World War I, I think most people you know, will recall, uh, but World War II veterans swelled its ranks after returning home in 1945 and 46. So could you speak a little bit about the contributions that Chinese American veterans made to the Legion? And then also, you know, what role uh, you've played in this project? Well, the uh, Legion membership actually reached an all time high over 3 million right after uh, World War II. And needless to say, we recognize over 20,000 uh, Chinese Americans serve. Uh, not everybody joined the American Legion. The uh, Chinese, Amer Chinese American that have joined and created their own American Legion out of necessity after the war, especially in the larger cities like you know New York and San Francisco and so forth, uh, they recognize that the uh, after you serve as a veteran, this government does offer many benefits that could help them uh, moving into, quote unquote, the mainstream faster. Things like GI Bill educations, loans, and you know all the other good things, uh, medicals that goes with it. Uh, but if you ask me what's the biggest contribution of the Chinese American World War II veterans, I would believe that their biggest contribution actually is outside of the American Legion, because uh, we, uh, you know, our number doesn't make any difference anywhere except where any Chinatown is located. Uh, those uh, twenty thousand returned Chinese American veterans, they went back and they utilized the benefit the government offer, and they better themselves. And by better themselves, they most of the time they serve as a bridge between the confine of the old Chinatown to what the outside world. And then because of the law where the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act was revoked and they were allowed to start bringing the wife with the, uh, with the war bride, uh, all of a sudden you change from the Chinatown community or Chinese community from a bachelor, uh, single bachelor period and to a, a community that's actually resemble a normal society community, uh, wife, young kids, all that. And because of their service with the, uh, with the uh, US government, their wife, their children gets a better opportunity to go into school, education, jobs. And then that's where all the Chinatowns around United States, around the big cities start flourish. And it, it actually moved the Chinese, uh, I guess it moved us forward a lot quicker than we would if we, we have to rely on ourselves to make it. You raise a great point there, Fang, about the American legions and not only the role that Chinese Americans played in the legion, uh, which was you know, a local organization as much it was, as it was a national advocacy group, but also the legion's role in helping these Chinese Americans come back after the war. Um, and to that point, I think you know, it, it'd be great to ask uh, Elaine um, about your father's service um, during the war. Did he ever talk about his military service to you? When we were growing up in Mississippi, my, none of my siblings or, nor I remember him talking about uh, his service while we were growing up in Mississippi. But then that could be because we were so young. Uh, it could have been that he was so um, busy with his own business and you know the, uh, the jobs of, of raising a family. 
Uh, but he, he really didn't talk very much about uh, the war itself. However, there was always war memorabilia in the house. We, there was a, a sword that he had gotten uh, when he was in Japan for the occupation that hung in our house. Uh, he had memorabilia from the Philippines, baskets, and he kept um, uh, the, the um, personal items, the personal effects. And so we always knew that that was part of his, um, uh, his background. And uh, we probably didn't uh, really address it until we were older, we were young adults. Uh, as a matter of fact, I recently came across a, a letter that my dad had written me back in 1970 when my brother was also serving in Vietnam at the time. And he did make reference to uh, the comparison between uh, my, my brother's years uh, or experiences in uh, Vietnam uh, versus his um, experience in the South Pacific during World War II. So he really didn't start talking about it until we were all young adults. And uh, then he started talking more about it uh, in earnest when he was probably closer toward retirement. And then the grandchildren came along. He had four grandkids. And we, uh, my sister and I tried to make sure that we actively engaged the, uh, the children with uh, their, their gong gong, their grandfather, and uh, in asking him questions. And uh, we tried to record it as best we could. And, uh, and then uh, in the mid nineties, dad uh, decided to write his memoir. And so he did. And it was basically a stream of conscious, uh, you know, just, just random thoughts. Uh, but he did try to um, uh, express uh, some of his uh, experiences and he did devote uh, a number of passages to his experiences during World War II. It sounds like it was a really formative experience in his life that he was really proud of, you know, judging by how prominently he displayed those things in, in your home and, and how he mentioned it to your uh, brother later on. Um, did, uh, and, and how do you think um, his, his war experiences maybe shaped his outlook on, on being an, an American later in life? Well, I think uh, ever since my father came to the States, which was in 1930, he was 13 years old. He was very excited about being there. His family essentially had, had sent him to America so that he would get an education and he would ultimately get a job so that he could support the family back in, in China. And so they, uh, he always had a very strong um, feeling and patriotism about America, even as a, a young boy. And uh, he expressed that throughout his entire life. He talked about being an American. He talked about how Americans were uh, so uh, ingenious uh, that uh, they, had, they had lots of integrity. He was, he was all 100% American in his thought and even in his purchases. He reflected that in his purchases. He refused to buy any car other than an American car. Uh, all his appliances, everything was always American. So he definitely, um, you know, that, that kind of pride uh, was transferred over to the family. And, and his war experiences helped him meet your mother. Is that correct? Uh, he, he did, yes. Uh, my mother was a, a, a war bride and they met uh, in China. Uh, when my father went back after World War II had ended and he went back to see his family and they had been separated for 16 years. So that was uh, the, the very, very big event. And then it, as it turned out, uh, um, mutual, well, actually it was my mother's brother and it was my father's brother who basically introduced them because they were working for, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't remember what the, uh, um, uh, the organization would be, but it had to do with uh, the, um, the, uh, the relief and assistance to China after the war by the allies. And uh, so anyway, they met and it wasn't too long that they decided that uh, they would get married. And so that was in uh, the fall of 1946. And they knew that uh, their life was going to be in America. Uh, there was no talk about staying in, in China. And so they, uh, they arrived in uh, San Francisco uh, in January of 1947. 
That's, that's really an incredible story. And the, your, your own uh, you know, family story uh, is, is just, you know, just one of these stories that behind the names that were included in Samantha's book. So I wanted to ask, you know, Samantha and Frank, how much information, you know, was it your goal to include about each veteran? I mean, obviously, you know, a, a book that includes the, the personal stories of each one would be, you know, beyond the, the scope of your abilities, I suppose, right? Oh, completely beyond the scope of our ability. Um, that would be impossible because there is very, very little information available at this juncture. Uh, many of our veterans have passed. So we provide um, eight point data points, uh, their name, rank, serial number, any alias, their branch of service, their place of birth, whether or not they were a citizen. Um, ah, what was the last one? I have to look, let me just pull the book out. <laughs> My memory is, is tough. So branch, service number, rank, date of enlistment, year of birth, place of birth, their race, because there was some interesting findings in our research that um, because Chinese, uh, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, Chinese was not a category that you can check a box off in, in your enlistment form. So also intake is, is subjective. So many of our veterans were called something other than Chinese. And they were black, they were white, they were oriental, they were Sinkian, which that stymied Frank 100%. What the heck is a Sinkian? <laughs> so um, they were referred to everything else but Chinese. It wasn't until the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, in 1943 that you started to see the uh, ethnicity of Chinese mentioned in any of the service records. So that and that was act was only repealed because uh, by lobbying um, from from a lot of uh, congressmen and a lot of Chinese Americans because uh, China was you know such a staunch ally of the United States during World War II and was fighting the bulk of Japanese forces in the Pacific. Oh yeah, it took the shaming of Madam Chiang Kai-shek to the members of Congress. She addressed both houses of Congress and shamed them for their horrible treatment of Chinese. Um, and there were allies and she pointed out going, what the heck is going on guys? We're allies and you have no path for citizenship. You're teaching, you're treating Chinese and Chinese Americans like second class citizens. So that immediately guilted a lot of people into advocating for um, the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act. But what's very curious here is that the Chinese Exclusion Act itself <coughs> as a name is still on the books. All the language in within the bill has been has been has not disappeared, but doesn't appear when you look at the congressional record because it was repealed. However, the actual act itself, in terms of name, still is on the congressional record. And, so, and Frank, speak what, what kind of curious stuff did you did I send you and make you go through? Um, the biggest thing was working through the full three information from NARA, the NARA list based upon Chinese sounding names and, you know, trying to figure out if uh, Robert E. Lee from Virginia and Robert E. Lee from California were what whether one whether they Chinese or um, English ancestry, um, and there was only there was a couple other names where the European name and the Chinese last name are the same, and that meant going in, searching, finding the person, and then doing a genealogical search on them to find out who their parents were. It was huge. The, the research aspect of this book was huge. And we were very, very fortunate to have um, teams of young people who were paid. Everybody was paid. No one worked for free. 
so um, <clears throat> who helped support and research this effort on our behalf. So and it must have been especially challenging because like a lot of immigrants to the United States, Chinese Americans, they did change their names, um, you know, sometimes willingly, sometimes out of necessity. Uh, and then that would make tr tracking them down and, and doing their, their genealogy even more challenging, I imagine. It, was, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, but it was incredibly fulfilling. Whenever we found something, because our expectations were zero. So when you start from zero and you, you hit 100, you're excited. I mean, we spent weeks upon weeks of going to the National Archives at the beginning of this project looking for data. And, you know, we would, we would go to the, to NARA in College Park and park ourselves in, on the second floor where the military data is, was, as well as on the fourth floor where the uh, static images were. And we couldn't find anything, you know, when we looked under World War II. Uh, when we looked under Chinese, they kept giving us China as the Chinese with, Chinese American participating, but there were no Chinese Americans. They were all Westerners. So um, after weeks and weeks of research, we finally found two images that just brought us great joy and motivation to move forward. So all these little nuggets of, of information, these treasures that we hold so dear and close to our heart that kept us motivated, like the picture behind me. This photograph was taken um, in 1943 in Dayton, Ohio. It's the Army Air Corps marching. It's the 14th uh, service group who were, who were uh, in, a, in a military base near Dayton, Ohio, who were marching on July 4th. When we found this image, we were like, Yay, we really did participate. We really did exist. We found an image of, uh, of uh, uh, two men, two soldiers, a Moy and a Lee, no, a Moy and a Wong, who were being sworn in as citizens in CBI, in the China Burma India Theater. Finding that image was phenomenal. And then finding the highest ranking. Um, service personnel who was a commissioned officer was uh, Major Edwin Al Yang, finding his photograph in the National Archives just validated our research. And it was just those little nuggets that kept us going because trust me, they didn't come all at once. We had to continue to search and continue the search. And it was painstaking, but so rewarding. That's why getting this book published Huge, huge. So satisfying the at the end of Very at the end of a long journey. <laughs> yeah. But and part of this challenge must have been that the Chinese Americans, unlike African Americans or Japanese Americans, didn't serve in segregated units. So they really were in every branch of the service, you know, in every theater of war, right? Yes, they were. And um, when we first started this project, we only our advisor, K. Scott Wong, out of Williams College in Massachusetts, Dr. Wong, had said to us. There were only 12,000 Chinese Americans who served and we're like scratching our head going, well, that's a pretty low number. What, we'll take your word for it. And then as we searched more, the numbers kept growing until we got to 22,827. That's the final count. And since we published the book, there's been more. We are getting more service notifications in, um, we've gotten at least a half dozen since we published and we've only been published for about two weeks now. Wow. So that's when we sent the document to our distributor, so. so Tyler? So I, yes. Um, the 14th Air Support Group, which is in the picture behind Samantha, was a all Chinese unit that was formed to deploy to China as part of the 14th Air Force under the theory of, ah, we had get all these Chinese soldier, uh, Chinese American soldiers, they will speak the language and thus they can be over there and help integrate the American air groups into uh, the Chinese uh, 
units there, not integrate, not integrate them into units, but to help them, just like Americans who went to England, you know, get to know the locals. And they found out, uh, one, some of the Chinese that had been born here didn't know any Chinese, or two, the where they were located, um, instead of speaking Mandarin Chinese, these folks spoke Cantonese over in or, China. Or der derivatives thereof. I mean, there was no common language amongst the Chinese who were living in the United States and the Chinese who were serving in the, um, the Chinese Air Force or the Chinese Armed Forces in China. They were centralized in Kunming and um, what was the other area? Yikes, my geography is a little off. Chongqing. Chongqing, Chongqing. correct, thank you. Um, no one spoke the same dialect. So their whole vision of having this Chinese American air <coughs> support group to help facilitate language did not work. It, it might come sad. as a surprise to, to, to many of our list, our, uh, you know, our viewers too, that there was an American military presence in China during World War II uh, as part of the, the Air Force and the strategic bombing campaign against Japan. Very few people know that for some reason. It's, it's disturbing well, to me. <laughs> it was a huge theater. I mean, gosh. People know well, only of the Flying Tigers, American volunteer group, which went over before the war started and then was active for six months, they became the centerpiece of what became the 14th Air Force that served in China. And then you had the bulk of the ground units were actually in Burma uh, and India. And the main American force within the boundaries of China itself was the Army Air Corps, Army Air Force. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So I, I wanted to, sorry, uh, Fang, did, did you uh, yeah, want to Yeah, I'd, like I'd like to add something to uh, what we were talking about as far as, uh, you know, having a whole uh, Chinese-American uh, Chinese GIs as a unit. Uh, yes, it's true that they originally, I guess the idea is that uh, they speak the language and all that. The language is the same, it's the dialect that kills everybody because uh, majority, I would say must be over 90% of the uh, Chinese American that served during World War II from the United States, even though they are born in the United States, chances are their parents are immigrant, immigrant from the southern part of China. That's all, all it is. So back then, Mandarin and Cantonese is not the uh, main language in Chinatown. It's a Toisanese, which is a, a local dialect in just a little small part of Canton, China. Of course, so when they went over to China, uh, they were stationed in Kunming and Chongqing, that's the Yunnan and uh, Sichuan province. Uh, that's a different dialects altogether. And Mandarin is working with the unit that are deployed in that area, the Chinese army. So yeah, you, you have a lot of uh, issue there. The other thing is that uh, I find out by talking to some of the uh, seniors from my uh, Legion post, a lot of them, they were traveling back and forth uh, in, within the CPI theater because a lot of them are truck drivers. They are going to the, the Burma Road to carry the supplies to the, to the back. Uh, well, not the front, to the back, which is in the Kunming, Chongqing area. Mm -hmm. So they, a lot of them were forced into be a translator and they, they learn as they go because the uh, dialect sometimes uh, you could pick up little bit more easier if you have the background. So uh, it's not all total failure, but uh, it, it took a lot of effort to make it happen. I think for a lot of Americans, World War II was the first, their first time out of the country. You know, even if they were immigrants, they, they, when they came to the United States, they would stay in, in one general area, whether it was Mississippi or whether it was, you know, Chinatown. Um, and then when they went overseas, that this, this uh, great, differences uh, in local cultures probably was a shock to them. And the same thing in Germany, there's different dialects, just like in China, where yep. some of them, you know, like, uh, in, or, in, or in Switzerland, you know, they speak uh, German, but it's, it's a lot different than in, uh, in uh, Northern Germany. So Fang, when you, uh, with your experiences in the Legion, 
did those networks um, and, and the, the, the close ties that resulted from a lot of the, the uh, Chinese immigrants being from the same area help locate any veterans for this project? Uh, yes, because uh, I didn't realize it when I first joined the Legion. I joined the Legion accidentally because what the Legion did for me when I was a little boy, I was like 15. I only been in the state like three years and gone to a uh, Chinese school, try to keep up with my Chinese. Uh, summer graduation, this tall guys walk up to the stage and he presented me with a check. It's a scholarship check I found out later and uh, a medal. And he was from the Legion. I have no idea what's it all about as far as the Legion go. Then later I find out that you, you need to serve you to, to earn the eligibility to join the Legion. So I, you know, I did, I went to Vietnam and came back and I joined. Uh, my scope at that time is strictly just New York Legion. I thought that was the only one. But after I kind of got involved with it, I shortly I find out that there were Chinese American Legion posts in Boston, in San Francisco, uh, Chicago, Detroit, all over the place. But sadly, because all of them were started by the World War II veterans, and after the war, obviously not as many Chinese who joined the uh, service in the United States. So therefore they, they have less and less memberships. And by the time I made my entry into the American Legion, a lot of the posts are not being active. But when I was getting ready to make uh, my campaign stops throughout the United States, I find out that the Chinese veterans Actually, they heard about it. They reach out and they come to me and say, hey, you know, I, I belong to post so and so and, and we're glad to have you, you know, uh, finally we have someone that could make it to the top and all that. Uh, I was walking <clears throat> in Phoenix doing our national convention and all of a sudden uh, this group of Chinese came out of nowhere and they grabbed a hold of me and said, I'm a legion too. But they were not active because uh, for whatever reason, they were just not involved. They, they are happy to settle within their community and, and do their things. So they were happy. They said, oh, yeah, thanks in the National Convention in Phoenix. So therefore, they came to Phoenix. I, uh, the year that I got elected, uh, the year before I got elected, we have a National Convention in Milwaukee. I was walking around uh, speaking to different states, delegates and all that. And all of a sudden, somebody from Illinois said, uh, Fang, I, I want you to come over here. We want to introduce you to someone. I walk over there with a couple elder Chinese gentlemen, and they belong to the Chinese American Legion in Chicago. I never heard of the Chicago Legion, but they say, Yeah, oh, we're glad that you're here. We are. So they were happy. Uh, Los Angeles, when uh, I was campaigning, uh, one of the real senior, he, he was a World War II, definitely. He walked up and said that, uh, you know, we used to have a, a post after the war, but then, you know, everybody got old. But now I would like to get it restarted. Can you help me? So I said, sure. It took us a while, but we were able to get that post uh, started again in Los Angeles, Chinatown. And we will actually get the same numbers awarded back to them. So, uh, by getting involved with the American Legion, by deeply involved with the American Legion, it uh, definitely strikes some sort of uh, uh, interest from various corner, uh, Seattle's and all that. They, people just come out of nowhere. And before that, I, I don't even know where to find them. So yeah, that's, it, it, it helps. That's incredible. And we should also note that it wasn't just, you know, we, we talk mostly about Chinese men uh, serving World War II. Uh, but Samantha, there were Chinese women who served in the military too, isn't that correct? Yeah, we have Chinese, we, have, we were able to identify 61 Chinese American women who served in World War II. And we actually have a graphic that we can share with you uh, that provides the statistics of uh, their service. If it comes up, that'd be great. And if it doesn't, there it is. Oh. So um, it's a little hard to read but out of, nope, that's not it. That's not it. That's it, whoa. <laughs> yes, women veterans. So um, you can see from this graphic that they serve from almost everywhere in the United States. 
Um, although there are 22 of the 61 were undefined. The highest ranking was a first lieutenant and that was a single, single one. Um, their citizenships were a little undefined, um, but we do know that most of them served in the Women's Army Air Group, Air Corps. So it's the Women's Army Corps, 47 of them served there and four of them were in the regular army. And then we have a couple of one-offs in the Air Corps, in the Air Force um, and the Waves, the Coast Guard and six were undefined. Uh, California was the highest number in terms of state of residence. And you can clearly see this on the, on the infographic and that's readily available to anyone who asks for these uh, pieces of statistical data. So thank you, thank you for putting that up. Excellent. So uh, the, the, you mentioned that the Chinese American women um, serve predominantly in the Women's Air Corps. Uh, which branch of the service no, did you No, Women's find? Army Corps, excuse me. Sorry, the Women's Only Army Corps. Only two women served in the Air Corps. Okay. And that was um, Hazel Ying Li and Maggie G. And so, so which, which branch was the most popular for Chinese Americans as a whole? Army. Hands down, it was the Army. We had 16,000 plus serve in the U.S. Army. Wow. That's, that's so a, we a have phenomenal. Those statistics readily available as well. Excellent. And so eventually, is it your hope um, that the book will, be, the information in the book will be available digitally? That's what our goal is. We are now working to have this resource expand and be online. Um, our intention is to work with several universities across the country. We don't wanna keep this in one single university's repository. We'd like one on the East Coast, we'd like one on the West Coast, one in Central, uh, Central US Northern and one Central US Southern. We're still working out all those relationships and it's our intention that with by the year 2023, 2024, this will be an online resource where that will be curated, that will allow more people to um, provide their information, um, make a query, be able to search for their loved ones or search for statistical data. This is not just for uh, scholars, it's not just for educators, it's for everyone. So hopefully all of this data will become common uh, Creative Commons by 2024. Oh, that's fantastic. So how many uh, veterans do you estimate are still with us, if any? Uh, well, when we first started this project, there were about 500. Right now we're under 50. And it's really sad because the Chinese World War II, uh, Chinese American World War II Veterans Recognition um, Congressional Gold Medal Act passed on December 20th of 2018 and the coin has still not been minted and we are losing Chinese American veterans every day. I mean, just last month alone, we lost three that I know of, but I, it usually comes to me much later. It's much after the fact. That, and it's just the same with, with all veterans, but especially with a smaller group like the Chinese Americans. Yeah, the attrition rate is, is, is pretty accurate. That comes from the, um, the Chinese World War II veterans in general. Mm -hmm. So when it comes, when you break it down to the Chinese Americans, we really don't have many left at all. It's very so sad because this bill was very important to the families and to myself because I am the daughter of four World War II veterans. You know, both my grandparents served, my father served, and my great uncle served. And it, I learned of that, I knew of this growing up, but it didn't become the impetus uh, or my passion to make this happen. It just is a byproduct of. So we're very, and very- hopefully, And hopefully your efforts will inspire others to, to rediscover that their family's past. To, to that well, I end- I hope so, I hope so. This has been an incredibly rewarding project and we, I, it's my intention to just change the line in history books. You know, I just, if we get a, a, a sentence fragment 
Chinese Americans served alongside of everybody else, you know, or, you know, when you start mentioning the ethnic groups in which are being recognized, like the Dostigi Airmen, the Navajo Code Talkers. I want the Chinese American World War II vets to be recognized because they talk about the Filipino scouts. They talk about the 100th Battalion of the 442. They don't talk about the Chinese Americans, yet we were the largest mi number of minority to serve. 22,827 and counting. That's a huge number. Other than African-Americans, of course. Yes. Uh, uh, but to, to that end, I wanted to, to ask if uh, Elaine, um, if was there anything that you learned about your father's service because of uh, your knowledge of uh, your involvement with this project that maybe encouraged you to go um, digging into his past that you discovered things you didn't know? Um, well, I, I think uh, that uh, with my siblings and, and myself, we have uh, uh, found that there's a lot of commonality with all, you know, the, the, especially from Mississippi, the folks who, who served there, and that we share an awful lot in common, and that, uh, you know, that, that uh, underlying current that runs with all of them is, is the pride that they have and the responsibility they, they felt in being able to serve in the military. And uh, so, uh, and in many cases, you know, it has transferred over to the children, the heirs. And so, yes, it, it has definitely lit a fire under me in, in terms of, um, you know, finding the rest of the family tree and maybe compiling uh, different, um, uh, you know, documents that we have or just personal things that we have and sharing them with the family. And definitely we want to make sure that our, our children and our grandchildren are, are going to, uh, you know, be able to look at these collections uh, with a lot of pride and with understanding that, you know, this is, this is part of, of the family and, and who we are. That is absolutely wonderful. It's so it's so good to hear it too. And I think you know one of the, my big takeaways from you know just speaking with you all and and uh, and reading about Chinese Americans is that their story you know it is distinct and yet it is part of the American story and that they did a lot of the same they had experienced um, a lot of the same things during World War II that that other veterans did you know with coming back and with. Um, leaving maybe their ethnic enclaves in, in, in Chinatown or in Mississippi and then spreading out all over the country um, and, and becoming, you know, achieving so many great things, them and their children, um, whether it was, you know, for working with NASA uh, or, or other, um, you know, developing other major companies and things like that. Uh, did, was there anything else that you wanted to add, Samantha, about um, your research or the communities that you studied? Well, what's really interesting, um, and, and Frank just pointed out something that we didn't talk about the Chinese from Hawaii. Okay, so that's, that's a really interesting uh, anecdote to our research. We were going, why are there so many Chinese Americans designated from the, from the state of Idaho? And when we were advocating for the Congressional Gold Medal Act, we kept popping into the representative offices of the senators and the congresspersons, um, just saying, hi, you need to support this bill. You know, we have X amount of Chinese Americans from Idaho. And they're like, you what? <laughs> you have how many Chinese people from Idaho? And we showed them the statistics <sighs> from Nora. And they were like, that's not possible. So we dug in a little bit more and with the help of Frank and some other historians involved in the project, we realized that it was a very simple reason why there were that many Chinese people in Idaho designated from the state of Idaho. It's because Hawaii was not a state yet. Hawaii did not become a state until 1959. Yet there were so many Chinese Americans who, or Chinese, who were not yet citizens, who, who hail from the great state of Hawaii. So where do you put them? What letter follows H? I. And the first I state is Idaho. So we have 2000 plus Chinese service personnel from the state of Idaho, but they're really from Hawaii. And that was a really interesting anecdote. We have some very interesting data to share. This is a 
data-driven book. It is not something that we pulled up out of our hat. We didn't make up these numbers. This is hardcore research. And um, we're very, very proud of some of the stories that we were able to uncover and discover. So that's fantastic. And you, those experiences really, you know, give color and give, uh, you know, e explanation for a lot of the difficulties of doing this kind of research and the problems that you had to solve in, oh, in really, was really getting at the, the truth of we these numbers. To... And, you know, you can't always believe what you read right off the bat. That's true. We actually had a team of researchers in the state of Hawaii, and we went to the Punchbowl Cemetery and took photographs of all the headstones of the servicemen and women from that state who were buried there, it, which is a national cemetery. And we took that data, we entered it into a giant spreadsheet and then did a cross-reference with all of our other resources, primary source and secondary source data. And it was phenomenal. It was truly mind-blowing the number of American, uh, Chinese who served in World War II from the state of Hawaii. Wow. What else did I, you want to share, Frank? Because Frank lived, read, Frank knows every name. He read every name. He, re he reviewed all of our research. He kept us honest. He would not let us, he, he wasn't very generous at times. <laughs> Yeah. He was like, no, uh, that doesn't sound right. Also, you need to explain that. More. Also, eliminating <laughs> all of the, quote, born in China uh, ethnic Russians. Oh, had, yes. We had to remove a lot of those. We had so many Russians who were born in China and were like, they can't be Chinese. And they weren't because they were, they were designated white. Okay. Uh, we had some really crazy names that we had to just remove from the roster. Because at one point in time, we had over 30,000 plus names in our data. And we're like, that's not possible. Even based on the census where we stemmed our, which became a principal uh, research point, there was no way that we had 33,000 Chinese Americans who served. <laughs> there was just no way, so. That, that is really fascinating too, that, that so, so many, you know, uh, things that, that people that, that, you know, in the records claimed that they um, were from China. You know, I, I wonder why that was, why the, the, the Russians, you know, uh, had been born in China. Maybe they were you know, diplomats or, or maybe it was a, there was some <coughs> advantage to claiming you went from Russia because of the, the communists. They fled the uh, communist revolution in 1917, 18. Mm -hmm. Essentially, they were the Tsarists, or what was known as the White Russians. Fled and into, not the cocktail. <laughs> yeah, that, that fled into especially Manchuria. And Tibet. That's where we got the Tibetan and Sinkian oh. um, nativity yeah. def definition, which was lots of fun. We had to scroll through that uh, line by line what how they were designated and whether or not they were really Chinese or were they another ethnic group. Um, and I know that this book is about Chinese Americans, but we did find a lot of other Asian ethnicities in our research that we that were categorized as Chinese but were not Chinese and they were clearly not Chinese, but we could not remove them from the roster. And it wasn't, you know, it's, it's under 150. Um, we couldn't remove them from the rosters because according to the US military, they were Chinese. Oh, wow. So that was our default. If the US military recognized them as a Chinese person, then we had to accept them as a Chinese person. Oh, okay. Very interesting. With the exception wow. of the Russians. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all so much for this, this work and this amazing product that you produced. And I think future historians and genealogists and family members will be thanking you uh, in perpetuity for all of this. And thank you so much for your time tonight and sharing uh, about the, your research. And uh, with that, I think we're just about out of time. And I want to turn it back over to my colleague, Abby. 
Yes, so thank you, Tyler, and thank you to our wonderful panel uh, this evening for uh, speaking with us about Chinese American World War II veterans. I also want to thank you all joining us uh, from your homes. If you enjoyed this program, please check out our website at the National World War II Museum for some uh, upcoming programs. Uh, you can check that out at www.nationalww2museum.org. So thank you all so much and have a lovely evening.